What if I told you that within your house plant collection lies a plant that's honestly probably not a favorite? On the plus side, it's pretty easy to care for and is often recommended as a good plant for beginners thanks to its non-fussy nature. And it's not very rare. You can find it at any big box store. And it's not particularly interesting to look at as compared to something like a pink princess violet endron. It just has the occasional speckled leaves. Yet under the surface of this common house plant lies a poison that was used as a device of torture for slaves, silenced would-be eyewitnesses, and even almost became a sterilization tool in Nazi experiments. Welcome to the history of plants. My name is Megan Bream, and this episode explores the complicated history of the Diefenbachia plant, also known as the dumb cane. Native to the tropical regions of Central and South America, the dumb cane has been cultivated for centuries. Now, I know I just gave its appearance some shade, but if you think about the first plants to be domesticated for indoor use, it makes sense that one of the reasons it was so popular was due to its striking appearance and its ability to thrive indoors with minimal care. It became particularly popular during the Victorian era when houseplants were used as symbols of status and sophistication kind of like today, in certain circles at least. But Victorians weren't the only fans of the Diefenbachia. Natives of Suriname, a small country in South America, found this plant helpful for getting rid of skin blemishes and for removing corms on the bottoms of feet. They even believed that making a poultice from it could cure yaws, an infectious disease that unfortunately is quite contagious and mostly affects kids in tropical areas. However, beneath this decorative facade and apparent skin healer lies a darker past. The name dumb cane itself hints at the consequences of what lies beneath its bushy leaves. And that's why I was so interested in making this story the first episode of this podcast, because the history of the Diefenbachia isn't just about a plant. It's about how botanical knowledge has been weaponized throughout human history. Now, let me break down exactly what makes this plant so dangerous. The Diefenbachia contains tiny needle-shaped crystals that are called raphides. These crystals are made of calcium oxalate and they are literally like microscopic daggers that can penetrate tissue on contact. In the botany world, calcium oxalate acts as a defense mechanism for the plant to prevent herbivores from eating its leaves and stems. And Diefenbachia aren't the only plants to produce these crystals. They can be found in organisms that use photosynthesis for cell generation, ranging from algae all the way up to the giant sequoia. We even produce calcium oxalate, well, kinda. Leafy vegetables we consume that contain the crystals will combine with calcium to create kidney stones. So the hits just keep on coming. Now, when any part of the diafimbachia is chewed or crushed, these raphides are released and they immediately begin piercing soft tissues of the mouth and throat, causing intense burning and swelling. This is actually how the plant got its common name. The swelling can be so severe that it temporarily prevents speech, making the victim what people used to call dumb. Now, the scientific understanding of Diefenbachia's toxicity brings us to a chilling chapter in its history. Imagine a situation where the ability to speak freely is taken away, not by force, but by the cunning use of this seemingly innocent plant. Ethnobotanists have discovered the Carib people in Dominica, a part of the West Indies, would use Diefenbachia as a poison for their arrows. It's also said that they would mash it up and mix it into food to poison their enemies. Legend has it that this stuff can, quote, kill four generations. During the Caribbean slave trade, plantation owners discovered these properties and began cultivating Diefenbachia specifically as a tool for torture. They would force enslaved people to chew the leaves as punishment, causing excruciating pain and temporarily disabling their ability to speak. Also in my research, I found stories from Caribbean plantations that show these plants were deliberately grown near slave quarters. The psychological impact of having this threat constantly near your home, it must have been devastating. In 1952, Jim Crimmins, co-founder of the Heathcote Botanical Gardens in Fort Pierce, Florida, wrote to a colleague about a story he heard. Allegedly in the Bahamas, a heinous crime had been committed seemingly out of the public eye. Well, almost out of the public eye because there was one brave eyewitness who came forward to testify. Apparently, the criminal found out about this witness. Now, it's unclear if the criminal was the culprit of this next part or they sent someone instead. Regardless, 
An unknown assailant lay in wait for the witness to appear and stuffed dumb cane into their mouths, causing them such immense pain and suffering that they were unable to speak. Consequently, when they went in front of the judge, they were unable to testify and the criminal was acquitted. While most cases of DF and Bacchio poisoning result in relatively mild symptoms, the potential for severe reactions and even death underscore the plant's inherent toxicity. The dangerous potential, unfortunately, did not escape the attention of some of the darkest minds of the 20th century. Now, let me back up a second and talk about Dr. Konstantin Herring. During the 1820s, he enrolled at the University of Leipzig where he accidentally injured himself during a routine post-mortem examination. Unfortunately, his injury was so severe that the only logical conclusion was amputation, but Herring refused and instead opted for homeopathic intervention, which he had begun studying, and it worked. Despite earning his doctoral degree in 1826, he became a strong advocate of homeopathy, this is jumping ahead in the timeline a little bit, but in 1833, he moved to the United States and became what is considered the father of American homeopathy. That's how gung-ho he was about it. Going back, in 1827, he took an assignment by the Saxon monarchy to study the natural history of Suriname, focusing on ethnomedical lore. His findings would be sent back in letters to Germany and were published in homeopathic archives, but were not well received by the Saxon crown, who believed his methods were too unorthodox and ended up terminating their working relationship with him. However, in 1832, he began writing about DF and Bacchia and his observations of how natives were using it. He noted the juice of the plant created pain and burning that he likened to, quote, a fresh wound, unquote, upon contact with the skin. And he also began to notice that some natives were diluting and then drinking the juice as a method of contraception. He notes, quote, sexual organs are larger as though bloated, flabby and perspiring. Impotence, the male member remains slack, even with lasciviousness and stimulation. Incomplete erection with premature ejaculation, painful erection without sexual desire, changing in a day from lasciviousness with slack penis, no semen results from intercourse, and no pregnancy results." End quote. When he opened up his medical practice in America, he continued to write about the DF and Bacchia, considering it as a homeopathic treatment for sexual related disorders or as a potential sexual enhancer. He recommended it for everything from impotence, nymphomania, masturbation addictions, to vaginal itching and enhancing quote, female genital voluptuousness. His thinking was that if a big gulp of the juice would cause infertility, maybe that was too much. Maybe instead, just a little dab will do ya. His work with the dumb cane ended up being cited in the French pharmacological journal Union Pharmaceutique, which Professor Georg Dragendorf used in his book, this is the English name, uh, The Medicinal Plants of Various Peoples and Times. I can't say the German word. This handbook became of interest to Gerhard Magnus, a medical doctor in Germany who studied the ethnobotanical knowledge of German peasants and their ancestors. Magnus was an interesting character. He began his traditional medical practice as a field physician during the First World War. Post-war, he received his medical degree in 1919 and opened the Mautus Company with his two brothers, which marketed homeopathic preparations. It actually still exists to this day, but instead of that, they are manufacturing bulk organic and inorganic medicinals. So kind of staying true to their original purpose. On the one hand, he felt the bureaucracy of academic medicine and clinical practice turned patients into objects and doctors into employees of large insurance plans, which as an American, all I can say is, yep. On the other hand, he was a researcher who experimented with sterilization methods on animals. One of those methods involved the usage of DF and Bacchia, with Maudas commenting, quote, all things are poison and nothing without poison. The dosage alone makes the difference in whether a thing is poison or not a poison, end quote. Based on the book, Medical Botany and Cultural Politics in Interwar Germany, it seems that Maudas believed the Nazi scientific practices would bring about a quote, new German healing art, end quote. However, I should clarify that there is no definitive proof that Maudas was interested in eugenics and he was not a signed party member, though it appears he was sympathetic to their scientific goals. His work with DF and Bacchia caught the attention of Dr. Adolf Pokorny, I hope I'm saying that right, a subordinate to Heinrich Himmler 
the Nazi politician who is often credited as the principal architect of the Holocaust. Himmler was interested in using Maudus's work and company to import enough Diefenbachia to sterilize three million Bolsheviks combined to German prisons. The ultimate goal was to turn them into laborers who couldn't reproduce to continue the bloodlines that Himmler believed were impure. Maudus was told not to share any more findings on the topic, but he would still be able to work with criminals who would have been sterilized under current laws anyways. He decided to pass on that offer and eventually the project died out because the Nazis could not acquire enough supplies of Duncane to move forward. The Diefenbachia with its potent toxicity is just one example of our fascination with plants that have a darker side. Throughout history, botanical knowledge has been weaponized, used not for healing, but for harm. Ancient civilizations employed poisonous plants in warfare, lacing arrows and darts with deadly toxins. And think of the infamous hemlock used to execute Socrates, or the nightshade, a notorious poison with a long and sinister history. These examples demonstrate how the natural world, often seen by some as a source of beauty and healing, can also be a source of immense danger to others. The use of plants as weapons extends beyond outright poisoning. Consider the deliberate spread of invasive species that disrupt ecosystems and cause widespread ecological damage. This act, while not immediately lethal to humans, can have a devastating long-term consequence for both human societies and the planet as a whole. It is a sobering reminder that the line between beneficial and harmful can be blurred when it comes to our relationship with the plant kingdom. And understanding the potential dangers of plants is crucial, not for our own safety, but also for the responsible stewardship of the natural world. So there you have it, the fascinating and somewhat sinister story of the dumb cane from a source of wonder and curiosity to a tool of oppression and a symbol of danger. This plant has a complex history that frankly mirrors our own. And it serves as a reminder that even the most beautiful and seemingly innocuous things can have a dark side. My name is Megan Brame. Thank you for joining me on this first episode of the history of plants. If you would like to dive deeper into the sources I used, you can find them in the show notes. Until next time, greenies, stay curious and don't forget to flourish.